Thursday, July 16, 2012. This is Alan Gassman on behalf of the Florida Professional Education Foundation. I've got with me our guest, Lester Perling, to talk about what you do not know may hurt you, how medical practice employees can bring down a practice. And today we have physicians, we have medical practice managers, we have some CPAs, we have some healthcare lawyers, and Lester and I just wanted to talk about some of the things we've seen in the last two or three years and some of the trends we're seeing relating to medical practice employees. And Lester, welcome. Thank you, Alan. And everybody attending should have a copy of our PowerPoint. If you're not seeing it, then uh, you can call Janine at 727-442-1200 and she'll help you out. You can try extension 3 for her. Also, uh, if you want a copy of the PowerPoint or if you want to distribute the PowerPoint, please feel free to do so. As opposed to a special outline here, instead I've simply enclosed one of our articles that we commonly distribute called The Biggest Mistakes Doctors Make. And if you are a doctor or you work with doctors, you can understand that this outline gets longer almost every week. And just going to page four of the outline, I'm going to start right in with failure to maintain medical law compliance. Now, we see many situations where medical practices are not in compliance with the Medicare anti-kickback statute, the Stark law, the anti-markup uh, laws, and then we see situations where this comes to light not because the client came to a lawyer and said, look things over, how, how am I doing, but because somebody got angry with the doctor or with the practice, maybe an employee, maybe an office manager, maybe a billing company, and they just go report it and try to earn some money while doing so. So Lester, you want to give us a little bit of background and wisdom on this? Sure. Um, as by now most listeners probably know, um, the United States False Claims Act provides financial incentive for individuals to become whistleblowers against um, medical practices um, by offering them a significant percentage of any recovery. And in, in uh, the current uh, environment, there are uh, one of my one of my colleagues in my office is fond of saying there's at least one whistle one whistleblower for every healthcare provider in the country. Wow! And what what he means by that is really in today's world nobody is immune, and there are more and more plaintiffs lawyers out there who are very happy to at least consider bringing these cases. I mean, many more get brought to attorneys than probably are ever filed. But the problem in today's world, too, is that there are a lot of plaintiff's lawyers, and this is certainly true in Florida, who, because of restrictions based on tort reform, have not as much work to do and are going into this field. They're not really that sophisticated or educated, either in the, whistle, in the False Claims Act or in the substantive you know, healthcare laws that they're seeking to uh, enforce by representing a whistleblower. And so they bring suits that are certainly of very questionable um, quality. Many of them don't, have, don't see the light of day with the Department of Justice, but they're becoming more willing now when the Department of Justice declines to intervene to get involved uh, or to continue to the suit going even though it really lacks any substantial merit. And so whether or not, however the suit revolves, resolves rather it's a an extremely expensive process to defend against and most of the you know not most but certainly a significant number of these suits if not most are brought by current and or former employees of the providers uh, medical practice uh, and otherwise um, I think Alan there may be a slide that references a whistleblower case brought against a physician in your neck of the woods that was brought by a uh, former employee you know, and employees now are disgruntled um, with their uh, employer. This is certainly one way to retaliate against them by bringing a whistleblower suit based on information that they have or they think they have. And other employees, they're, they're doing it more what I'll call legitimately uh, because they have a concern about compliance. They can't get it addressed by their employer who basically you know, 
poo-poos them or they don't feel comfortable going to them because of fear of retaliation. And this is an outlet. Not all whistleblowers are actually motivated by, by money, and some of them don't whistleblow through the False Claims Act. So it's very necessary that employees' concerns be taken seriously, that, um, that medical practices listen to them. Um, when they do have concerns, they provide feedback to them. I mean, obviously, every healthcare provider should have some form of compliance program through which all of this could be addressed, and we're not going to get into that today. But even without a formal compliance program, it definitely behooves the employer to pay attention to their employees. Um, they often have cor the correct information when the employer doesn't. They may know things that are going on. So uh, preventing a whistleblower is critically important, and often that can simply be done by the type of relationship the employer has with the employees and paying attention uh, to them. It's kind of like physicians can prevent malpractice suits by just sitting down and listening and talking to their patients about their concerns, and this is very similar. Okay. Now, what can you do besides listening to the employees and making sure that you're not violating these laws? Is there, could you have the employees sign something every six months saying that they're not aware of anything wrong going on in the practice and they recognize an obligation to immediately report it? You could. It does not at all prevent them from becoming a whistleblower um, and does not really require them um, to report it. it. It might help you to terminate them when they bring up an issue and, or become a whistleblower as a current employee and they never brought it to the company's attention and didn't follow the policy, although terminating them at that point carries significant risks. So I'm not sure, in reality, how much that does for you because it, it, there's no way to stop someone from being a whistleblower. And in fact, in settlement agreements where there are between or, or severance agreements between employer employers and former employees, where there's provisions that prohibit the employee from bringing a false claim suit, courts have pretty consistently say that, said those are unenforceable as against public policy and might have some psychological impact as with the form you're talking about, but it certainly cannot prevent them from becoming whistleblowers, um, either legally or, or, for that matter, practically. It's really more responding to them and their concerns and, and, and providing feedback to them. If they're wrong, explain why they're wrong. If they're right, fix it and let them know that it's been fixed. Um, because most, I really think most employees are not coming from a bad place when they make these complaints. They're, they're trying to make sure that they and their employer are doing the right thing. Right. What about a situation where a medical practice hires a new doctor who isn't on the panels yet and bills the new doctor's visit in one of the older doctor's names? Well, I mean, at least technically, that's probably a false, a, a false insurance claim because they're telling the carrier, whoever that may be, that that the service was rendered by Dr. Smith when, in fact, it was rendered by an uncredentialed doctor, Dr. Jones. And so that, that, that you know, technically becomes a false insurance claim um, and could constitute mail fraud or wire fraud depending on how it's transmitted if somebody really wanted to get particularly nasty about it. Um, and so I've seen it, too, in, in you know, in government programs in Medicare where a doctor does not yet have his provider number and so the group bills under a different position. Uh, and trust me, those have turned into some, some problems. I don't know that, well, yeah, in fact, in, I'm representing one client now in a false claims case where that is one of several allegations that services were billed by one physician when rendered by another, under one physician when in fact the service was rendered by a different physician. Yeah, so I all of those. Hmm? I see that as commonly done, and everybody thinks it's an innocent error, but I think it causes a lot of exposure. It, it definitely does. I mean, it, it's, I think most people, when you push them, they know on its face, well, there's got to be something wrong with billing it as if one person did it when, in fact, someone else did it. Um, but yet, it is a very, I agree with you, it is a, a very common practice. Okay, so moving now to liability, I've got on slide 10 a March 28, 2012 report of a hospital sued for a nurse's negligence. And I see so often that physician groups or physicians have individual malpractice policies that will not necessarily answer to liabilities caused as vicarious liability by someone the physician employs. 
And quite often, the practice needs to buy a separate policy or a rider to cover vicarious liability or make sure that nurses and other personnel have their own policies. That's something that a lot of medical practices are exposed for but don't even really notice it or are not aware of it. In fact, I have one client, he's a primary care doctor. Whenever he has a high-risk patient, he has one of his nurse practitioners spend 100% of the time in the room with the patient and him because the nurse practitioners each have $2 million policies. And he thinks in a complicated situation, he wants as much good minds and as much malpractice coverage in place as possible. So I think that's something else to consider under this topic. Any comments on that, Lester? I agree, but I, I also, you know, practices also need to think about, you know, some of them try to avoid uh, direct liability for employees by engaging physicians as independent contractors or engaging where the physician wants that so the money's paid to their PA rather than them directly. And the practice thinks they're not going to be liable for what they do because they're independent contractors. And while the liability theories might be different when they're independent contractors than direct employees, there's still significant potential liability that I think practices don't often always, or maybe not often, um, yeah, that's a good point because under the Florida law, although you, although the master is not necessarily responsible for the lo the obligations or liabilities incurred by an independent contractor, you still have the concept of ostensible employee, where if a patient walks into a an office and thinks that a doctor there is working for the practice entity, the patient it doesn't matter whether it's an independent contractor. The liability lawyers will tell you about that and tell you about how many jury verdicts there are where that's happened. Or they, they might be able to have the court find as a matter of law that the individual was, in fact, an employee despite being paid as an independent contractor because the physician, in fact, meets all of the IRS common law tests for employment rather than um, contractor. So it's so there's you know, a lot of, of risk that goes unrecognized in those relationships. Absolutely. So then I'm on page 13, and that's the failure to procure and maintain proper insurances, which we're going to talk about later. But a couple of these on page 14 unowned automobile liability insurance. If I send one of my employees on an errand and they're in, in an accident, my law firm's going to be responsible for that. So we have a separate policy called an unowned automobile liability insurance policy to take care of that. And then workers' compensation. You know, if you have an employee and they are not on workers' compensation and they get injured, the employer ends up paying what the workers' compensation uh, insurance would have paid that employee. And I had a client, a physician client, who had to pay an employee who couldn't work for seven years because he had his wife had forgotten to procure the workers' compensation insurance. And of course, liability insurance enters into that. By the way, uh, when this is over, which will be in two or three minutes, we're going to replay a prior webinar that we have on how to terminate an employee. I thought that that might be apropos for this. Now, uh, Lester, any comments on the insurance aspects? No, I think you've, you've covered that. I mean, again, it's just something that people don't always think about, all of the various risks that are out there and that, that they're assuming without understanding. They're assuming them, so it's an important point. Right. So then we go to, to page 16, and that's the mistake of failure to theft-proof the practice's monies and accounts receivable. So often when I meet with a, first, with a client for the first time, I just say, so tell me, can the person who tells the billing computer that somebody paid, can they get hold of a check and not have anyone else in the office know they got hold of that check? And so often the client looks at me and says, it's kind of strange you would ask, but of course. Matilda goes to the post office, picks up all the checks, opens them, opens the envelopes, and tells the billing computer that the patient has paid. Well, you've given Matilda the license to steal. And, you know, it's just not fair to Matilda to give her that much temptation. All she has to do is divert one of those checks by endorsement to another account, tell the computer that, that the account was paid, and the theft is done. The other mistake is just signing checks or letting an employee sign checks where you don't actually look at the invoice. 
I mean, how do you know that that power company check is actually going to your power company and not the employee's power company? And when we see employee theft, which we do every year, by the time the client finds it, it's an average of $150,000 to $250,000 that's gone, and it's almost never recovered. Lester, any thoughts on that? Um, no, nothing. I, I, well, one thing that occurred to me while you were talking was, was when about missing checks was the age-old problem of missing um, prescription pads. Different issue, but it, it again goes to the sort of the heart of the thing, which is the practice, understanding what what documents it possesses, what types of what types of considerations it needs to give to security within the office. But that can similarly create a lot of issues. So it's again just sort of goes to the heart of, of, sort of if you will, risk management in the office. And then my final point on page 21, which is tell employees not to sign agreements, not to sign receipts, not to sign what anything that a salesperson or someone delivering something might put under their nose. I've had situations where a copier salesman come in and says, please sign for this paper. And what the person signs was a 48-month renewal of a maintenance agreement on a copier at outrageous prices. Or please sign this receipt. I just brought this. The doctor wants to see how this ultrasound machine works. What the person at the front desk signed is a fully binding contract to buy an ultrasound machine. So you have to be really careful with your employees to let them know not to sign things unless they check with you first. Can you think of anything else in that vein, Lester? Uh, it's a little bit off topic, but I did want to bring up, because I know we're just about out of time, employees, if, if a practice has, a, has marketing employees about the importance of making sure that the practice has very sound policies that are, are uh, uh, the employees are made aware of that, that prohibit the payment of any form of remuneration. I think you have uh, one of the slides that we didn't cover. Um, an issue where marketing people are out there paying kickbacks, and that that will come back to the employer, uh, even if the employer didn't know, didn't condone it, wasn't aware of it. That could still create a problem and liability for the employer. Um, so when employees are out there, out and about in public, um, trying to draw a business for a medical practice or other venture, they really need to have guidelines, and there needs to be some supervision over what they're doing and very close scrutiny of their expense reports, things like that, to try to ensure that they're not engaging in the type of conduct that's going to come back and haunt the employer. And that's a darn good reason to never pay an employee a direct commission based upon new patient or new patient or referral production, even if that might be permitted under the exceptions that we have to the Patient Brokering Act and the Medicare Anti-Kickback statute for employees who are involved in rendering the services, it's certainly safer never to pay an employee that type of direct incentive for that yeah, reason. You're really, you're really incentivizing them to, to potentially do something wrong if they're so uh, inclined. And we've also seen employees taking that money and actually using portions of that money as the kickback you know, by saying, well, look, I'll get X percent. If you refer, I'll give you X percent of my X percent. So it, it, it can be an issue, for sure. OK. Very good. Well, for those of you attending, we have some supplemental materials. There's some information from Watson Insurance on dishonesty bonds that you can buy for employees who might steal from you or from others, um, and other types of, of coverages for insurance. And now, if you'll stand by, and some whistleblower information, and now if you'll stand by in about one to two minutes, we will replay the, pro the webinar we did last year on how and when to terminate an employee. Have a great afternoon. Lester, thank you very much for your participation today. I really appreciate it, as I'm My sure you here. Thank you. Janine, it's all yours. Thanks, Alan. We'll begin shortly.
Hi, this is Alan Gassman, and I, wanted, I want to welcome Colleen Flynn to our seminar, our webinar, on when and how to terminate a questionable employer, I mean employee. <laughs> an employer is probably what the other people are thinking. But anyway, I want to welcome you to the webinar, and I'm going to first speak for about 10 minutes on mostly how not to hire the wrong employee, and then Colleen, who is an excellent employment lawyer with the Johnson Pope Rupel and Burns Law Firm, is going to talk about terminating employees. We also have a guest with us, Bob Burke, a lawyer in Palm Harbor, one of my heroes and mentors, who is going to chime in towards the end on some of his thoughts on what, what he's heard. You should be tuned in on your computer, and you should see the advertisement for our next webinar, which is a week from Saturday, November 20, called Corn Flakes and Common Estate Planning Mistakes, where I'll talk about common mistakes that people make in their estate planning. So if you're watching the screen, I'm going to try to page forward. And I'm going to ask, ah, there we go. In here. OK, common initial hiring criteria. My theme is not to hire the wrong person to begin with. So what we do in our law firm is, first of all, we have them make an appointment, and we question whether they showed up on time. Then, believe it or not, once they show up, our receptionist gives them an application and directs them to an alcove near the reception area, and we time how long it takes them to walk to that alcove. And believe it or not, if they walk slow, they, it turns out that they will not be a good employee. Third, we time how long it takes them to fill out the forms. If it takes them more than 45 minutes to fill out the forms, they will not be a good employee for us. Fourth, we kind of keep track of what they're doing while they're completing the forms. If they're taking uh, calls and they're texting their friends and they're calling their, their friends to find out the answers to questions on our questionnaire, they're probably not going to be a very good employee for us. Fourth, of course, we have them take a typing exam, a grammar exam, and sorting tests. And then, if they pass all of these things, somebody at our law firm will interview them. Now, I found out a long time ago that it does no good whatsoever for me to speak with them or even meet them before the hiring decision is made, because I tend to like everybody. And it turns out that likability is not the best criteria for an employee, at least at our law firm. Now, we also will then give a candidate who we would otherwise hire the Omnia Profile Compatibility Test, it costs us $150. It's part of the questionnaire they fill out. And Omnia then gives us a profile which shows us whether this person is aggressive and plays to win, in which event they usually don't make it as a lawyer clerical staff member. Secondly, whether they're cautious or and risk averse, which we want that to be higher. Third, friendliness may or may not count, depending upon what function they occupy in the law firm. Uh, sometimes people who are friendly can't stop talking, and that's a problem if they're working in the billing department or they're trying to type all day. Or whether they're analytical or not, you may want somebody who can really think things through, or you may want somebody who's able to do monotonous work and doesn't want to. Fifth, whether they're flexible and impatient so they can do multitasks, or opposite, whether they're patient and persistent. These two lines, people are either one or the other or a combination of the two. You can't be both. Then whether they're independent and self-managing. And lastly, whether they are afraid to make a mistake. Sometimes if people are afraid to make a mistake, they go too slow. Sometimes if people are afraid to make a mistake, that's exactly what you want. Now this person was is somebody we would never hire. And the next page shows you the Omnia, the Omnia psychologist write up on the person. Noticing that the Omnia psychologist knows how I work and write this up showing that she probably would not want to work with me. Then, the next person, this is an ideal candidate for a clerical person in our law firm. They're not real aggressive. They're very cautious. They're friendly enough. They're analytical. They're flexible to put up with changes in, in situation. They're fairly patient. 
So they don't want to do things on their own. They want to do things as we would like them to do them. And they're very compliant. That's the backstop for mistakes. So you might want to check out on the profiles. Uh, the information on that is you would call Carletta Neal, N-E-A-L, at 813-525-7117 and tell her that I said that you're a client of mine and you would get a free profile. Do one on a, on a good employee or a mediocre employee and you'll be, you'll be shocked at how well it comes out, how close it comes out to the situation. Now, once we've made the hire, let me emphasize that that process weeds out most of the people who we would not want to hire. And not hiring the wrong person is a very valuable thing for our law firm. We also run a criminal investigation. All we do is we check on the internet, Pinellas, Hillsborough, and every county where they've lived to look for criminal, prior criminal activity. And that's usually where I'll see their picture and their arrest record. Now, when we hire them, they sign a 90-day probationary letter so that if we fire them during the first 90 days, we don't have to pay unemployment compensation or it doesn't affect our unemployment compensation. And Colleen is nodding yes here. This is something you definitely want to do. You definitely want to do this because if you terminate somebody within the 90-day probationary period, it will not be charged against the employer's record. The person may or may not be entitled to benefits based on their uh, history during the last quarters that unemployment looks at, but your employer tax rate will not be implicated or increased if you terminate someone during the 90-day probationary period. So you want to be sure to get it out to them in writing that they sign off, that they understand that their first 90 days are probationary in nature. And then you know, in the event that they are terminated within those 90 days, you want to be certain, and we'll talk about this more later, that you fill out the uh, unemployment claim form properly so that your account is not charged for those benefits. Because it's been my experience that it's virtually impossible to fix if the initial form from unemployment is not filled out properly by your office staff. And we'll talk about that later. OK, and then there's some other things we ask them to sign. They sign our company policy on sexual harassment, that if they see or experience sexual harassment, they must report it to us immediately, whether it's them or someone else. Now, uh, let me go back to that. The next thing we do in our firm is we give them enough training so that they can do one function well for four to six hours, and then we have them do that function for four to six hours. Now, in our firm, most of the people here have to know how to type and how to do word processing. So we have fake typing and word processing projects that we give them. We teach them just enough to know how to type a letter and how to print it out and how to get the envelope done. And then we give them five out to six hours of fake work, which they think is real work. And at the end of that day or that second day, we review it very carefully. And we are quite likely to terminate them if they haven't done a good job. Because if they can't do that part of the job, if you can identify a core part of the job, and they can't do that core part of the job the first or second day, then you want to just give them a nice check. And a, can't, I can't say a hug, but you just want to say goodbye as quickly as you can. Now, if and when we have a problem with the employee, we also have a non-compliance notice. And this form is what we use. Somebody sits down with the employee and says, look, here's what happened. Uh, we're sorry it happened. We know it was a mistake. We should have warned you better. But you know, next time, uh, don't go barefoot in the reception area. They fill this out and they sign it. We feel less guilty when we terminate them. I don't know that this has a great legal effect, but it can't hurt. Also, they give us an applicant statement uh, where we can check their their uh, information later. Uh, that's the release that they sign when, they, when, when we, they come in. They acknowledge that we can monitor their computer use. And we do, in fact, monitor their computer use. And there's some very interesting things that come off of that computer when we monitor uh, the use. And we think it's a good thing they know we monitor the use. And then we go to the termination decision. Uh, I'm a little bit out of order here, but some, I'm on the screen. When you have an employee and you're wondering whether to terminate them, and you have agonized over it, and you are my client, and you finally get around to calling me, 98 out of 100 times, 
what I'm thinking is, why didn't you already terminate this person? I can tell you from experience that if there's a doubt, there's lots of people who would like to have their job. And you really need to think twice about going through what we call the slow pain of having a problematic employee versus the fast pain of going ahead and terminating that person. Um, I presently have a manager who doesn't mind terminating employees. I cannot do it. I get guilty, I feel bad, I sweat. I can't fire somebody. But I have a manager who likes to fire people. And before her, I had a manager who didn't like to fire people, so I gave her a $200 bonus every time she terminated somebody. Because I knew it was an excruciating experience. And Colleen's going to talk a little bit about how you can terminate people. Because you don't have to do it face to face. You can do it by email. You can do it by phone call. You can be a coward. The main thing is just get them out of your get them out of your office when it's when it's time to. Uh, but when you do terminate somebody, you I like the saying, hold your loved ones close and your enemies closer. If you're going to have somebody who's a potential enemy, you want to be very friendly to them. They are not going to admit fault. Uh, Colleen's going to tell you, all you really need to tell them is, you're a really, really nice person. I can't tell you how much I like you. I think that you're a better fit somewhere else. And we're going to uh, put get more into that. Uh, if it's a long-term person and you're going to pay them a lot of money, you might want to pay them over time so that, and tell them, look, I'm going to give you five checks a week for the next five weeks, and I expect that you're not going to call the other employees and say anything bad about us, and that you're going to return your laptop, and that you're going to, and that gives them five weeks to cool down and to uh, cooperate with you on what you need when you have questions about all those things they were supposed to do that they, that they uh, put in their bottom drawer. Colleen's going to talk about a little whether you should ask them for a release or they would release any potential claims against your firm when you, when you terminate them. And when somebody leaves by choice, you definitely want to document that they left by choice. Because they may leave by choice and then go down to, to workers' conference on unemployment and say that they didn't leave by choice. Next, don't hesitate to call in a lawyer or an investigator to interview the other employees when you have someone leave explosively or problematically. The other employees will be very supportive when a lawyer or an investigator sits down with them and says, look, Holly Purebred left last Thursday and she was very upset. And she said some things that we really don't understand and we want to know, are you aware of anything bad that anyone here did to Holly Purebred? And what happened to Polly Purebred? The employees are going to be very supportive of the employer during that interview. It may go so well that they may put it on tape. On the other hand, a month later, when that employee has left and has become drinking buddies with Polly Purebred, things can be more problematic. So we often have had Colleen or an investigator go in and talk to employees when somebody leaves them in the apple cart is being upset. Now, just a couple of whimsical things. The Peter principle. Uh, now, this is where you have good employees and you don't want them to become problematic employees. And you have to remember the Peter principle, which is that everyone rises to their level of incompetence. And you can take a great employee who's doing something at one level, and you can promote them to a level where they will just be awful. You can give them a raise before you find out whether they can whether they can handle that better job, and then you can really have a, a problem. And uh, Professor Peters wrote a beautiful book in 1969, The Peter Principle. It's a great, great work. And his his corollary is that lots of businesses in the United States are just full of people who reach their level of incompetency, and the only people getting anything done are the people who haven't been promoted yet. So if you see that in your own organization, you just want to be careful. If you have an employee that you think you might want to promote, you might want to just have, tell them that you're cross-training. You're thinking about it. Don't give them a raise. Just cross-train. Then give it to them for a week. And tell them how good they did and move them back to a lower position, as opposed to ruining a, a great employee by making them a mediocre employee. 
Uh, also, what I call the Marty Schweitzer walk. Marty Schweitzer was a local CPA who we all miss. And he said, told me, Alan, just walk around your office, say hello to everyone, and ask them what they're doing. You'll be amazed. And I am amazed. I walk by somebody's desk. Hey, Gertrude, what are you doing? Oh, I'm copying the file. Well, Gertrude, that file was already scanned. Why are you copying it? Well, I thought when you hired me 12 years ago, you told me to copy every file. So I've been copying every file for the last eight years. Well, Gertrude, I bought a scanner eight years ago. You don't have to copy those files anymore. Oh, great. So walk around your office, say hello to people, and go, hey, what are you doing? Look at their computer screen, whether it's your work or not. I love this little cartoon. Uh, the boss says, why aren't you working? And the employee says, I didn't see you coming. All right. Colleen, I'm going to hand it over to you now. I've taken too much of your time. No. Thanks for being a good listener. And what do you have to say to us? Well, I think what Alan said was all good advice, that a lot of these issues uh, can be resolved on the front end. And on the front end, I mean, not only with respect to you investigating your potential uh, employee, if I investigate, I mean, you know, talking with them, giving them the test, uh, calling the references, and really, you know, doing due diligence before you just hire somebody because you're desperate. I, I assure you your business is not going to shut down because you have a vacancy um, that's going to remain open for three or four more days. You will find the right person, and in the end, finding the right person is better and more cost effective than, you know, hiring somebody because they're the best of the lot and then a few weeks later realizing we need to start the interviewing process all over again. So. I would agree with everything Alan said and, and point out that many of these things can be handled on the front end. Um, in essence, I prepared, you know, top ten things to remember when you're terminating an employee. And, uh, and well, I see right now up on the screen you've got my background information. I asked a little bit about myself. Like Alan said, I, I'm a shareholder at Johnson Pope. I practice in the labor and employment group and commercial litigation. Um, work with businesses and individuals and employment related matters. And you know, I feel much uh, a lot of my work is really the day to day counseling on clients on their employment and, you know, human resource issues because many of the clients aren't big enough for a formal HR department or uh, administrator and so I'm sort of the, the helper with their own office administrator who wear who may wear many hats and may not have the HR expertise to always know uh, what the laws are when they're faced with, with questions. So uh, it's, it's a very interesting role that I, that I play these days. So let's see here. Well, we've got, um, OK, so I guess we're going to start at number one here, as opposed to number 10. But is there any way if we could fix the PowerPoint to start at 10 as opposed to 1? Can I do that? Sure. Right here. Let's here. Flip to page 34. OK. Let me flip to the end, and then we'll just work backwards here. Get to page 34. We'll start at 10 for everybody. Good. Sorry about that. That's OK. No problem. And then I'll just go backwards. OK, so um, now that we are on uh, number 10, I thought we would do somewhat of a top 10 list. When you get to the point where you've decided that it's time to terminate someone or you're contemplating uh, terminating someone, it's important to contemplate uh, what, what are the reasons. Is it their performance, that they're unable to perform the job duties that they were hired for? Is it that they're just not a good fit, they don't get along well with the other people in the office? Do they have attendance problems, tardiness, calling in sick, constantly needing days off without uh, you know, giving proper notice, not calling in if they're going to be late? I mean, there's a variety of problems. Complaints. Uh, have you received complaints about this person from your clients or your customers or even you know, your, your fellow professionals that you work with? I, I have to tell you that um, there have been times where I've called other attorneys' offices and I've said, wow, your receptionist is wonderful or your secretary is great. Or I say, do you know that I was just on hold for eight minutes and the person didn't even know who you were who answered the phone? So I think you know, a lot of times we all get complaints from our customers or our uh, fellow professionals that we really need to think about. Um, are steps? Are things missing? Are you missing money? I mean, 
you know, if you're in a doctor's office, are you having problems with drugs disappearing? What is going on? Internet usage. Alan touched on that earlier, that they have a policy that we will monitor your Internet usage. Is your policy that you're not supposed to be on the Internet except for business-related work other than, you know, a short period of time? And if I monitor your Internet usage and I find that, you know, you're on the Internet four hours out of the day, um, other issues that I thought of that I didn't put on the PowerPoint as I drove over here, I actually thought misrepresentations on applications. Did they misrepresent something that you didn't catch during the interviewing phase that you have later learned is, you know, quite frankly false? And that is grounds for termination right there. Um, qualifications, they misrepresent their qualifications. You, you've got many reasons that you, you may want to terminate someone. It's important to think through them all, and they're all valid reasons. Here in Florida, we are uh, an at-will employment state, meaning I can terminate you for any reason I want. The caveat is that so long as it does not violate a federally protected right or I'm not discriminating against you. So if Alan and I are, you know, if I hire Alan as a any role in my law firm, and he is just not getting along with the folks, he cannot work well with them, I just don't really care for working with him, that's a legitimate reason to fire somebody. Um, when you look at what are non-legitimate reasons, we'll, we'll go to that in uh, the next slide, but you know, we always want to be certain that we understand the reason for contemplating the, uh, contemplating the termination and making the decision. Because based on what the employee does once they become a former employee, it's going to be very important to have consistency in what our explanation is for why they were fired if there is, uh, you know, an allegation of wrongdoing on the part of the employer. So it's very important to contemplate, you know, why you're actually uh, uh, firing somebody, and uh, what we'll get to uh, in a moment here is actually documenting those reasons for firing somebody. All right, so let's go back to slide nine, or the, the ninth reason here. Just uh, roll backwards. All right, let's see, I'm not having a joke about how many lawyers it takes to Right, how many lawyers does it take to run a PowerPoint here? Bob Burke, are you there? Are you mic'd up? All right, there we go. What other issues should be factored into the analysis to make the termination? Once you've started thinking about, well, I want to fire Susie for these reasons, what other issues, if any, should you um, consider? Well, the biggest issue is that uh, whether the employee has exercised any of their state or federally protected statutory rights. And I understand that most of the employers who are probably listening tonight are smaller and are not covered by many of the statutes that we're going to um, discuss briefly here. But as I touched on earlier, you cannot terminate somebody for being part of a protected class or having exercised a statutorily protected right. And what does that mean? Um, that means that obviously I think the easy one is that you can't terminate somebody for discriminatory reasons. You don't like somebody because of their gender, their national origin, their pregnant, um, things of that nature. We all know those are pretty easy, that those are protected. Um, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, that's the ADA, you are only covered by the ADA if you have 15 or more employees. So while I am not saying that it is legal in any way, shape, or form to discriminate against disabled folks. The Americans with Disabilities Act only applies to people with 15 employers with 15 employees or more. The Age Discrimination Act, which is the ADEA, only applies to employers with 20 or more. Uh, Title VII, which is what everyone's probably familiar with, which protects gender, national origin, religion, et cetera, that protects 15. Uh, employers with 15 or more. The um, Florida Civil Rights Act, which uh, mimics the federal act, but is a state act, that applies to employers with 15 or more employees. Um, however, you may have local ordinances, depending on what county you're in, that uh, apply. Here in Pinellas County, we have an ordinance that applies to employers with five or uh, more employees. However, the federal um, laws are they have a lot of teeth to them and that you file 
lawsuit, charges with the EEOC lawsuits, et cetera, et cetera, damages are available. The local ordinance does not have the same damage um, damages available as the federal lawsuit. So keep that in mind. Other laws that you may need to think about are, are something like the Florida Whistleblower Act. That applies to employers with 10 employees. And when we talk about counting employees, it counts full and part-time employees. So you have to count everybody. You don't just count your um, your full-time people. The Florida Whistleblower Act uh, would apply in a case where an employee has made a complaint to the employer even, not just to you know law enforcement or agency, but if an employee complains to you that you are doing something illegal and then you terminate them, they potentially have a Florida whistleblower claim against you. The uh, adverse employment action, uh, they can sue for that. So let's say someone complains to you, they claim that you're filing fraudulent Medicare claims, and that angers you, and so you fire them. Uh, or you demote them from you know, head billing officer to assistant receptionist, and you cut their pay. That is going to be deemed adverse employment action, and they're potentially going to have a complaint, to you, complaint against you under the Florida Whistleblower Act because they complained about illegal behavior. Now, I always get the question is, what if they're completely delusional and they're making all these delusional accusations and they become a problematic employee? Well, that's something that you're really going to have to document and be sure that you have enough documentation to prove that they've made the you know, outloud, outlandish complaints, that they're, you know, quote unquote a troublemaker rather than a whistleblower. So be careful if someone comes to you complaining of illegal behavior by the employer, by by yourself basically, um, and then taking adverse employment action against them. Um, the other thing that needs to be thought of is you know, FMLA, and I, I understand it probably doesn't apply to anybody here. That's the Family and Medical Leave Act. That applies to employers with 50 or more employees within a 75-mile radius. And that is the law that, applies, that allows for 12-week leave to care for your own serious medical condition or the condition of a family member or if you have the birth of a child. Um, there have recently been additions to it which provide up to 26-week leave to care for uh, an injured service member. So that law um, is only for 50 employees or more. However, if people have exercised their rights under these laws, you want to be absolutely sure that you're not going to be accused of retaliation. And when I say exercise their rights, what does that mean? For instance, under FMLA, that means have they taken FMLA leave? Have they asked for FMLA leave and you don't want to give it to them? Or you're annoyed that they've taken eight weeks off after they had a baby and so you're going to fire them. Or under the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, you know, they've asked you for what's deemed to be a reasonable accommodation, and you've denied the accommodation, and now you want to fire them. So you want to be certain when you're contemplating determination what issues could come up down the road or what claims could they make um, against you. I, I put in here any complaints um, by the employee, and that really goes into you know the whistleblower claim, or really any of the claims. Have they complained that you know they're being sexually harassed by a coworker, and you really like that coworker, you know that coworker would never do it. You can't believe why they would make such ridiculous allegations, and so you say, you know what, I don't want to hear this from you. You're fired. Well, that you cannot do that. That's something you need to be careful about. Um, you need to, we can, we can do a whole seminar on this about what to do when someone complains about sexual harassment, but once somebody has complained about something, they are in what I like to call a hyper-protected category. You cannot retaliate against them because many times it's the retaliation claim that will, that will get you in trouble more than anything else. That's a good reason for doctor's offices to be very careful about how they bill and about who does their billing work or whether they use a billing company. Uh -huh. Uh, because the expense besides risk of repaying the carriers is whistleblowers, which we've seen oh, right. on many occasions. Sure. I mean, we've all seen in the news these key TAM cases of people, you know, the welfare case and trying to, you know, get the money back on behalf of the federal government. And so it's just, just a word of caution there about people. And, and I'm not saying that people who make all these complaints are always legitimate, but the complaint does not always have to be well-founded or legitimate. Under the statute, it's just that they complained about illegal behavior. So you don't have, they don't have to win their case by proving 
that you were doing something illegal. The proof is that they complained about something illegal and that adverse employment action was taken against them. Um, in many instances, I've counseled employers who have said to me, somebody, you know, one of my employees is accusing me of doing X, Y, Z. And I said, well, what, what have you said in response to them? And what I have come up with is the best way, I think, to handle that when the employee is wrong is to affirmatively tell them, and I even say sometimes in writing, in, in bullet point format in an email, thank you for your bringing this to our attention. We looked into it, we talked to our CPA, or we talked to whomever, and they've confirmed that our handling of, you know, the tax issue or, or this other matter is appropriate under, you know, the IRS guidance or something like that. That was just the example that I, that I recently used um, in, in a case. So I think that's important to keep in mind when they come complaining about they think you're doing something illegal. Just, just be careful with that one because, again, Florida whistleblower statute only uh, applies when you have 10 employees. So many of you are going to get closer to that act than, than any of the others. Um, once you've analyzed all the is those issues, um, what would we do then? Well, the next thing I always tell people is to uh, look at the documentation in the personnel file. And this is really where Alan and I uh, and our presentations are merged very nicely because if you handle getting a lot of the documentation on the front end, it's going to ease your headaches on the back end. And what do I mean by that? Um, the first thing is, if you don't have a handbook or company policies that you give out to the new hires and have them sign it before they start working, you need to do that. That needs to have all your policies in there. Internet usage, tardiness, um, calling in sick, grooming, appearance, what, is, what, is, what are they expected to wear to work, uh, what's your office policy on cell phones, lunch breaks, clocking in and clocking out. Uh, filling in timesheets, things of that nature. All of those things need to be in the employee handbook. If you're covered by the Family Medical Leave Act, uh, the law requires that at the time people are hired, either in the handbook or separately, that they're given a copy of the uh, Family and Medical Leave Act so the, the employees know their rights. Um, you can get that right off the Department of Labor website. It's form WH1420. You don't have to type it up in a pretty version and put it in the handbook you know, nicely. You can give them that form when they are hired and you have fulfilled your statutory obligation. Um, so at the front end, you really need to um, be sure that you have the acknowledgement of the handbook and the company policies. That also ties into the 90-day probationary period that Alan was talking about at the outset. Many times, the 90-day probationary period is contained in the handbook, as it should be 100% of the time. But I also like it to be specifically stated either in a separate form or on the acknowledgement to the handbook that you give them and they date the day they start working or the day before. Because you want to get them all of this um, information and get them to acknowledge all of the information before they start working. So you have now met all your obligations under, you know, Family and Medical Leave Act is applicable, under um, Florida Unemployment, that you've given them notice of the probationary period. All of those items need to be signed before they start working. Other things that I would like to see in the, uh, in the personnel file before we make the decision is the performance reviews. What do they say? Are the performance reviews glowing? And then all of a sudden, they've complained about something and now you fired them? And then you want to tell me, well, they were terrible at X, Y, and Z. Well, okay, but where is the proof of that? And if the lawsuit comes and their file is now going to be come into evidence, there's going to be nothing in that file that shows why, you know, John or Mike were bad at whatever duties were assigned to them. So it's important for employers to do performance reviews and appraisals with their employees, whether it's annually or semi-annually more often than that. I encourage everybody to do one within the 90 days because otherwise that 90 days can come or go and on day 93 if you realize they're not doing a good job and you've blown the 90 days, you're now going to be charged with their benefit. Um, so that, that's important to do. When you do a performance review, it's also important that the employee signs it, that you've given it to them. 
they're not acknowledging that they agree with it. Um, you may even want to have a part on there for their comment section, but they are acknowledging that they received it. And that's the important thing because down the road later, uh, when, when you have their deposition, they say, I never got that. They made that performance review terrible, you know, after I left. I never received that. So I think it's very important to at least have them sign that they received it. They can write on there, I disagree with it. This never happened. These issues weren't my fault. Um, you're a terrible teacher. Whatever they want to write on it is fine, but the important thing is that they acknowledge that they got it. Um, other things that you should keep in a personnel file if you get complaints by clients. Did you get a written note? Um, I came to your office and your receptionist, Mary, was the rudest receptionist I've ever seen in my 60 years of life. I want that note in um, Mary's file because, you know, you're going to talk to her and discipline her anyways, but if something happens and then we say, well, one of our clients complained about it, well, what proof are you going to have? How are we even going to remember which client it is? And what if the clients moved away? Are we going to track them down? So if that's important, if you have anything from outside sources, um, complaining about your folks, I think it's very important to keep them. Um, notes on attendance. I find this to be important because uh, this helps to make the claim about attendance in the event that people aren't following proper policies for asking for days off, um, calling in. Not only, hopefully, if you're keeping good time records, are their time records going to be accurate on when they clocked in and clocked out, but it's important, I think, to document that on, you know, November 11th, Jennifer was supposed to be in the office at 9. She did not call. She breathed in at 9.45 without, you know, a good excuse. And she's therefore being disciplined. And I would have her sign that note, acknowledging that she violated company policy and that, you know, she realized she didn't show up on time. Um, are they just calling in sick constantly without having leave days? Um, what, what's their attendance? What are the problems there? Documenting, documenting, documenting is very important. Um, discipline notices or, or corrective actions, whatever you might want to call them, non-compliances, I think what Alan called them, anything you may have that you may write up the employee for, uh, keep those in the file. Don't you know, get rid of them after a certain period of time unless you've determined that it's your company policy to you know, erase history after six months or a year. I think you should always keep those things. And uh, they're always just good documentation for when, you know, when the person leaves. And you, know, you want to, um, again, on discipline actions, when you speak with the person about the problem, you want to document it. And I always recommend that the person signs it, that they received it. Again, they're not agreeing with it, but that they did receive it and that you did talk to them. So I think those are the most important thing to look at in their file when you're making this decision to terminate them. And having all these papers in the file only protects you in the event um, that after they're terminated, they bring a claim against you. Because you now have documentation in their file about why you fired, fired them. Um, you know, whether it was performance, Claims, failure to get along, failure to show up on time. You now have all these things in your files so you can um, prove down the road, if you need to, that you are making a fair decision and not a decision that would violate the, the law. Uh, seven, who should be involved in making the decision to terminate the employee? Well, the first person is the direct supervisor. Should they be involved? Obviously, the direct supervisor has the most information about the person's day-to-day -day job performance and how they're working out in the office. The direct supervisor's input is going to be vital in the decision-making process um, and in your gathering of information. And, and really the ultimate decision. So the direct supervisor's input is going to be very important practice administrator or office manager for other types of uh, businesses or the office manager is typically the person, if you don't have a formal HR uh, department or an HR person designated, the office administrator or practice administrator is going to be the first person typically who is responsible for personnel issues. And in fact, that may be the person who is the direct supervisor of these folks sometimes. So that person's input is going to be important. Um, 
I, I, I also listed here the managing physician uh, or really the, the professional. If you're in you know, a law office, you may have staff, and you may have an office manager, and then you may have the lawyer. All of the, um, the direct supervisor and the staff and uh, the direct supervisor of the staff member, as well as the, let's say, the ultimate doctor or the lawyer who that person works for, all these folks are going to have input into determination and into making the decision to terminate. So I think it's important that you get the information from all parties. Uh, you know, Alan, as, as the lawyer supervising a uh, legal assistant, you know, he has the input into the fact that, well, she's a good legal assistant. Well, maybe the office manager has the information to the fact, well, you know what, she never turns in her timesheet. She is consistently late for showing up for work. I always have to track her down to get X, Y, get her, get her billing sheets in. So it's important that there is a free exchange of information um, by the supervisors about the person who is, you know, potentially being terminated. And six, what everybody hates to talk about, delivering the news. Once there's been a decision that this is the right thing to do, there has to be the delivery of the news, unfortunately. And the issues that we face are the who, what, the when, and the where. Who delivers it? Well, as Alan discussed earlier, he doesn't like to terminate the people. He has a person who doesn't mind. That's fine. You can do it yourself if you're the doctor or the lawyer, or you can have your practice administrator do it. The important thing is not the who that does it, in my opinion, but it's the how and the where and the when and the what. Because the delivery of the message is just that. It's the delivery of the message. The important thing is you're not going to get into an argument with the person you're terminating. You're not going to have a given take. At this point, you've made the decision to terminate the person. It's done with. The important thing to me is that you do not misrepresent to the person why you are terminating them. Because if there is a problem down the road, the last thing you want to hear in a deposition is, well, isn't it true that when you fire them, you told them the reason you were firing them is X. And when they apply for unemployment benefits, and now when they file this lawsuit against you, you're telling me that the reason is Y. So consistency uh, is, is a big issue here. How? Do you have to do it in person? No. Alan's absolutely right. You don't have to do it in person. If the person has absconded and hasn't showed up for three days, you can email them and send a certified letter to their house telling them they don't ever need to return um, and you wish them the best in their future endeavors. Well, you can also send them a very friendly letter to their house saying, Dear Matilda, uh, I didn't want to embarrass you or have a stressful event, and I'm sorry, but it hasn't worked out, mm -hmm. and here's a couple weeks severance pay, and the stuff from your desk is in a box and we'll deliver it to you as soon as we get your your employee manual back. Absolutely. And, you, know, you, could do, you could do that in a very friendly way and you, not have to face them. You don't have to face them. That, that's absolutely true. Now, the issue that um, Alan just brought up with, with the severance pay, and we'll get to this at the end, uh, is that if you are offering severance pay, it's always my advice that you get a release in return. You don't owe them severance pay in the state of Florida. Um, unless you have a contract with these folks that mandate severance pay, you do not pay it. And in my opinion, if you are paying severance pay to somebody, you should get a release because that is additional consideration um, to them, and they, they, they should give you a release back. So I think uh, the big issue here is not giving them an incorrect reason when you fire them because you're uncomfortable or you don't want to say something. You just can say, Susie, this is not working out. That we are going to terminate you. Best of luck to you in the future. If they're sitting in your office. You know, they cause a big scene. That's always difficult. Um, but you have to just, you know, maintain the line, maintain the decision, stay calm, and do not, you know, go back and forth. Do not bargain with them. I think once you've made the decision, you've made the right decision if it's come this far, and you need to stick with the decision. And you can hire Colleen or me, and we'll come over and terminate it for you, which we've done before. Right. And I, I will tell you one experience that I had many years ago. I was hired to terminate or go to a termination with an office manager, and we were going to fire an employee. The employee walks in the door. She sees me sitting there. I think she knows what's going to happen. And the office manager says, I need to speak with you 
Mary Jane. And uh, Mary Jane, obviously not her real name, says, before you say anything, guess what? I'm pregnant. <laughs> this is a true story. And the office manager... would have been better to deliver a note to that person. Well, the office manager looked at me and I said, continue. Because the decision had been made to terminate the employee without the knowledge that she was pregnant. Now... Had she come in before we terminate, you know, days before this, and she said, "Oh, I'm pregnant," and then we said, "Well, we, you know, we might we might have a different analysis." But the analysis had been completed. She was going to be terminated. She walked into the office to be terminated, at which time she told the told the news, and so the news had no impact. So, uh, you know, the office manager, of course, looked at me like, "Oh dear," and so we continued. She uh, was terminated, and that was done in the appropriate manner. So. Just, just keep in mind, once you've made the decision to, to handle it um, appropriately, um, again, like Alan said, you don't even have to do it face-to-face -face if you don't want to. You know, there's pros and cons to all of it, but I think the, uh, the biggest thing, like he said, is you just stay calm. This is not a shouting match. You can do it very friendly. You can be done with it. Um, you know, there's certain circumstances that dictate... Um, you know, forceful removals of certain people from offices, but those are typically few and far between. In most cases, it's not a good fit. They're not doing a good job. You know, we just need to end their employment, and everybody needs to just move on. So, for the most part, um, you know, it should it should go smoothly. Once you've made the decision, you're sticking with your guns. Um, and if you have a person who's your office uh, administrator who is a seasoned veteran and knows how to, to handle these terminations, shouldn't have any problem. And That's I, their job, make them do it. Exactly. And I will tell you, I have a sister-in-law who is the nicest, nicest person in the whole world. And she used to be the director of HR for a very large company who went through a very, very large round of layoffs. And she fired so many people, I cannot tell you. And she was excellent at it. And it was partially because she was such a kind person. And as she looked at them and told them, I'm very sorry, we have to let you go. Um, they they felt okay about it. She didn't, you know, misrepresent anything. She didn't um, say anything that wasn't true, but she did it calmly and professionally, and and it worked out fine. She she's very good at it. It's, very, it's not easy. No one will tell you that it's easy to fire somebody, but you can do it. So what happens once the news is uh, delivered? We've got um, post termination, return of company property. That's always a big one in this day and age. Um, we're going to fix the PowerPoint so you get the right slide here. Post-termination return of company property, you know, changing the locks and the passwords, security codes, all that kind of good stuff. Um, the first thing to uh, remember when you're, um, once you terminate somebody is they do need to give you their items back. Um, keys, do they have keys to the office? You need those keys back. Uh, security system code, you need to change it. Computer passwords, when they're on their way out, they need, you want to be sure, if you can, before they go, that you can get into their computer. Whether that's a uh, policy you establish about uh, what their password is, they have to give you their password, um, that they can't password protect things. I've had many cases where a situation has gone wrong with an employee, and they leave, and they don't have... Um, the employer doesn't have the passwords, and maybe that employee had all the passwords to, um, you know, their payroll program or, or, you know, how to write checks or their client list or their uh, insurance billing code or something. So you want to be sure that you can get into all of their uh, computer um, programs, software, anything that they maintain. Uh, you need to be able to be sure you, you can get into that. Um, do they have a computer? Do they have a laptop? Do you want that computer back? Um, you want to be sure they're not taking anything with them. Do they have client lists? Do they have documents? What do they have? They need to leave it. They can't take it. Um, here's an important one. Does the employee have an agreement with restrictive covenants? And this is really going to affect, um, you know, typically it's your higher level employees, um, your employees who have access to this confidential information. What restrictive covenants do they have? Do they have non-solicitations? Do they have non-competes? Do they have non-disclosures? Um, even if your employees don't have a formal non-disclosure, you can make arguments under the law that they are uh, stealing things from you, if they're taking a bunch of your documents and, you know, many things that belong to you, that's theft regardless of whether or not you have a non-disclosure. But I always would recommend that, you know, you have a non-disclosure agreement with these folks if they're not disclosing 
your company property. Uh, your, you know, the things you've developed, your client list, your customer base, your trade, anything that's trade secrets and protectable, you want to protect because it's yours. Um, other restrictive covenants that sometimes apply, non-compete agreements, non-solicitation. You know, what do they have and what do we need to enforce? Do you need to write them a letter saying, Dear Joe, um, you know, enclosed is a copy of the agreement you signed when you started. We remind you that you are bound by your restrictive covenants um, for the next six, six months or a year or whatever it says. So keep all those things in mind once you terminated the person because you need all that stuff, for lack of a better term, back. Okay, so what's your next thing you need to think of? Um, next thing I always think of is dealing with making the announcements to the coworkers, the clients, etc. Um, you know, sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes you've got somebody who is really well liked that was either terrible at their job or did something improper that that you need to fire. Um, you know, it's important to maintain the party line. Um, whether you don't want to give any details to your staff, I think that in a lot of instances that's a good thing. But in other instances, that's not possible if you have a small office. But uh, you need to maintain the party line, and you can't have conflict between, let's say, what the ultimate decision by say the doctor is, and the practice administrator who may have to carry out that decision. The worst thing you can have is the practice administrator say, "Oh, I know, Doctor So and So shouldn't have fired fired her. She was such a sweet lady." You can't have that. Consistency in your office is very important among the management staff. Um, stop gossip. That's, that's a big one. Um, you know, there's always going to be some talk when people are, are fired. There's always going to be something. There's going to be somebody who's feeling for her. They really like having lunch with that person. But, but for the most part, you need to, you know, maintain positive outlook, not not talk about it. And if you haven't fully talked about it, you can just say to them, you know, look, it's unfortunate that she has to be terminated. Um, but we're going to move forward and work with the staff that we have now. So it, it's important. Um, also, if you know, clients ask you that you just say it was unfortunate that we parted ways, and, and leave it at that because you also don't ever want to be deemed of having you know the same someone or saying something negative about them. Um, the next thing to keep in mind after somebody is gone is the post-termination benefits. They need to get their final paycheck. Luckily, we don't live in California, so you don't have to cut them their check on the day they're going out the door. But you need to give them their final paycheck within their the cycle that you use. So if you close on the 15th, they get their pay check on the 15th. Um, if you have a vacation, accrued but unused vacation or sick leave, et cetera, and your policy says that you know they get that paid out when they leave, then you need to pay that out when, when they leave. And you need to cut that check within the next payroll cycle. Um, most people here probably may not be covered by COBRA, I believe. 20 employees, I believe, that are covered by COBRA, but I would have to look that up. Um, or continuation coverage may be offered under your policy. If they're entitled to COBRA or continuation coverage, I cannot tell you how important it is that they get the proper notices under the law. If they don't get the proper notices and they can't elect in the time period and they lose benefits, you are on the hook. So whether you do it yourself or your insurance company does it or your agent does it or your payroll company does it, you need to be sure that if these people are owed COBRA or continuation coverage um, notice that they are given that within the time parameters set forth by law. So that, that's very important. So what's going to come next? Lovely unemployment claim. And as everybody probably knows, um, you're going to get the form in the mail that says, Mary Jane has filed for unemployment. Please tell me a little bit about the situation. What days did she work there? What were the reasons for it? Um, the first thing that you need to be cognizant of is checking off the correct boxes. And I know this sounds so silly, but I probably six or eight months ago, I had a client who had a person handling all the unemployment claims who did not understand what the boxes meant, and she was checking off the wrong boxes for these people. And it was impacting them greatly because a bunch of folks who should not have been charged to their tax rate were charged to their tax rate and it was not able to be undone because the appeal period had lapsed by the time I figured out what was going on with unemployment. So when you get the form, please read it carefully and check off the appropriate boxes. The form asks you, was the first person terminated during the uh, 90 day probationary period that you had given them notice of. If that's the case, that's the box to check. 
Were they terminated because eh, they just weren't doing a good job? Okay, that's the box you check. Did they commit willful misconduct? And willful misconduct is basically something that they did intentionally to the employer or that's a willful violation of the employer's uh, conduct, policies, and procedures of which the employee was aware and of which the employer has the right to expect that they will follow. This gets into all your documentation about the disciplinary action. Um, if you, you know, obviously you're going to have a policy, you can't come to work um, drunk. If somebody comes to work drunk, that's a violation of your policy, and I would argue that that's willful misconduct. You need to document, obviously, when it happens. You need to check off the box for willful misconduct, and you need to take the position that they were terminated for willful misconduct when they showed up for work drunk. Likewise, somebody's stealing from you. To me, that's willful misconduct. Um, you check off the box for willful misconduct. You make the argument. If it's just that, you know, they're not doing a good job, they're not really good at the job, well, that's not willful misconduct. Um, so you need to analyze it. But if it is willful misconduct, you need to check off the box and take that position. Because once you don't check off the box, it's going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to undo because they are then going to be awarded benefits based on your checking off the box that they were either terminated for lack of work or terminated because they weren't doing a good job. They're going to get the benefit, and the appeal, when you try to appeal it later, the person's going to say, well, why did you check off this box? I mean, why are you changing your story now? Did you now talk to your lawyer or do some research online and see that you won't be charged? So what's the problem? Yeah, we're down to about four minutes. Okay, perfect. And um, so once you get the initial determination, it will say whether or not the person is entitled to benefit. And if you disagree, you want to appeal it within the time frame that's set forth on the notice. So you need to be certain that when you get these notices from unemployment, that you are um, following them and that you are uh, ma making sure all your appeals are going in within the time frame that's appropriate. Um, people always ask me, you know, should I appeal this one? Is this one willful misconduct? Well, each one is different, and you want to analyze it. But if it truly is willful misconduct, I would say that you should check off willful misconduct, and you should fight it, because otherwise you are going to have lots of benefits potentially charged to your account that shouldn't be. Um, I think the bigger issue is the 90-day probationary one. Um, I have seen clients that have high turnover. Uh, the high turnover is not a problem to your unemployment rate necessarily uh, as long as you're giving notice that it's within the 90-day probationary period and that you are terminating these people within the 90-day probationary period. And obviously, it's a no-brainer if the person quits. You check off the box that says they voluntarily resign. And as Alan said at the outset, it's always good to get it in writing from them that they resign. So that's important. The number one thing. Yeah, now that we're down to the top ten, the last thing I wanted to touch on is when you get a reference check by subsequent employers, what do you say and who should answer? My um, policy is that there should be one person that handles the reference check, and everybody should know that if you get a call and somebody wants a reference, it's directed to either the practice administrator or the doctor or the lawyer or whomever is uh, team the person to give the reference check. And what should the reference check contain? They're obviously their name, <laughs> dates of employment, their title, and, and really that's it. I mean, if they, if they want other information, I have, um, you know, you don't want to be the one giving it. You need to have policy in place for reference check. That's the information that you give out. And that way, that protects you from any claims of someone saying, well, Mr. Gassman misrepresented, he said all this false stuff about me, and now I can't find a job because he has that these malicious lies that aren't true. So having a policy that only one person does the references and only verifying dates of employment, title, what they did, and that they did in fact work there is just a conservative policy that will protect you. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. The last thing I wanted to touch on that um, Alan brought up that I had not um, put in my presentation is if you are in fact um, going to pay somebody severance when you're terminating them, it is uh, in my experience, the best idea to get a release. You can get a release that you know releases you from virtually everything except for claims under the Fair Labor Standards Act for overtime claims, and that's a whole different animal. We can have a whole evening on Fair Labor Standards Act claims, but for the most part, you can get a full release for any any and all claims that they may have up through the date of termination in exchange for additional money. You can't just get a release as they walk out the door and say, I want you to sign a release. You've got to give them consideration for the release. 
And with respect to the Fair Labor Standards Act, the only reason you can't get a full release from that is because those claims require court approval of a settlement. However, you can get them to certify that they've been paid for all hours worked, which could be used as evidence later in a case that they may bring against you under the Fair Labor Standards Act. You say, look, you signed this acknowledging that you were paid everything you were owed. You were paid for all your hours worked. So why are you now claiming this? So even though they could still hypothetically sue you, you have now good evidence. So. What side of that, Colleen, is when you get them this release, do they think, wow, I better go show this to my brother-in-law, the lawyer, and go see an employment lawyer, and then think of ways that maybe I can get even more money out of them? Which is always the flip side. But, I, you know, right now I think while the economy is tough and people are going to have a harder time finding a job, I think you're going to have more people that say, look, I'm going to find this release. I don't really have any claims against them. I think it's uh, interesting when people do go and have the agreements read, they talk to an employment lawyer, and the employment lawyer, in fact, they may be helpful. They may say, well, you don't really have any claims against yeah, them. What's your claim? You didn't work out well. You think that so-and-so is a jerk. So it can cut both ways. Alan is absolutely right. But you know, if, if you think that they're entitled to severance and you want to pay it to them, that's, that's obviously your option to not do it, not do the release. But Right. Bob, Bob Burke, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here. Excellent. Have anything to say? Well, a lot of information. Um, a, a couple of comments, if I might. First of all, I realize the webinar is how, to, how and when to terminate someone, but the fact of the matter is that 90-some-odd percent of all of this is a function of the efforts in hiring uh, what I'll call right people in the first place. A hundred percent of the time spent in trying to engage an employee is a small price of investment in comparison to the back-end efforts. They're just horrific on a back-end basis. Uh, point one. Number two is, as stated, we're an at-will state, but there's legal discrimination and there's illegal discrimination. Um, I can't sit there and fire somebody because of certain federal statutory things. Uh, we've, we've all heard the phrase race, creed, color, sex, etc. But just because I wear glasses, for example, now that I might even go to a disability, but the fact of the matter is, is because you're tall or short is, is there are forms of legal discrimination that are different from illegal discrimination. Um, second point. The, the, the third comment goes to all the various records. I've, I've, I've seen on the, on the webinar, and I, I totally agree with all the comments about uh, uh, keeping all appropriate records, but the fact is, is that I suspect that 90% of our clients simply don't keep those records correctly as such. And as a result, if they're going to terminate someone, I would much rather have them avoid the concept of cause and simply say that, you know, it's just not working out. Uh, that once you involve cause, then you've got to be able to prove the cause. And it's just far, far more easier, if you will, to simply deal with it on a without cause basis. Uh, uh, the, the last comment was that, that uh, before I chimed in, was the concept of severance. And yes, there is no requirement to pay severance. So what, what you should do is get an appropriate quid pro quo whether in the form of some form of, of release agreement uh, or otherwise, there, there, there shouldn't be a severance. Um, I, I know that we, we talked briefly about wage and hour, which is its own separate comment. The, the only comment I'd want to make to, to those listening is that if, if they're not paying time and a half past 40 hours, no matter what they're calling their staff personnel, they're inviting getting sued absolutely inviting it. So uh, just just those comments. Those are excellent, Bob. As a matter of fact, you and Colleen in the last eight minutes have answered every question that came in. 
<laughs> and uh, I agree with everything you said, Bob. And it's interesting. You and I handle the matters that don't become problems, and Colleen handles the matters that do become problems. So the real I'd, I'd like I'd like to take just just a minute uh, to talk about wage and hour for a second. I mean, there are law firms, unfortunately, brethren of ours in uh, uh, Tampa and other places that shotgun wage and hour litigation in that we, we call people uh, managers in some capacity or another. Well, the fact of the matter is that you need to be causing your employees to keep appropriate time records. You need to be paying them time and a half past 40 hours. If you're not doing it, you are absolutely inviting a former employee to sue you. Ab absolutely every single time. Right, and Bob, I just want to comment too that, and we can have a whole other webinar on this. We can have a day-long seminar on this. Is that people think I pay them salary, so I don't have to pay them time and a half? Oh yeah, I, how many times have we all heard that? Right. I only have one manager. Right. So much. And you just have, have everybody be a manager. Exactly. So I absolutely agree with Bob. And when he's talking about these law firms that do this, you drive up and down the street, you see it on TV. Have you not been paid your overtime wages? There's billboards out there. Um, so they, this is what they do, and the reason they do this is because the law allows them to collect their attorney fees. So now not only do you have to hire me, you have to pay them their overtime. You should have paid them plus liquidated damages, plus you have to pay their lawyer. So it's an expensive mistake to make. So just, just keep that in mind. And Bob, to your point, the other issue that I've been seeing a lot lately is the misclassification of people as independent contractors when they should have been classified as employees. Well, in, in those that are uh, of a medical profession on this line, um, anybody that's being somehow classified as an independent contractor that gets their finger pricked with anything I guarantee you the next day they're claiming that they're an employee from a worker's compensation standpoint. And the law really favors that. Uh, you're absolutely right. Those are excellent points. And, and just so everybody, I, I was at a seminar not too long ago that I learned that under the current presidential administration they have increased spending for the Department of Labor and the IRS to come investigate all of the classification of independent contractors because they believe that they've left um, billions of dollars of tax money and payroll taxes that they should have collected on the table but for this misclassification. So the issue is not only the claim by the uh, contractor slash employee but you're going to have the Department of Revenue on you and you're potentially have the IRS on you for the payroll taxes, and I believe there's also just a straight flat penalty by uh, Florida if you haven't paid workers' comp on somebody who should have been classified as an employee. Well, Co Colleen, let me, let me set up a question here. I'm, I'm a typical employer who has less than a certain number of employees, and I, I'd like you to speak to that particular number, and I don't have a handbook. I don't keep records. Yeah, I've got uh, an application for the employee, and maybe I did certain checks. Uh, maybe it was a, a credit report check, and, and maybe there's some drug testing, and maybe there's a criminal background. But whatever I did, that it turns out that, that it's the wrong person, and I don't have any records whatsoever. Well, are there are there circumstances where I can be so small? that realistically those records are, are, are really unnecessary or less than necessary. Because uh, you know, in, in a typical client scenario, I, I, it, in all respect, I've seen all the various forms and the probation forms and this form and that form. And that would be wonderful if I've got a 200-person office with an HR staff, blah, blah, blah. But you know, I'm a, a, a practicing doctor that's got running around like with hours all over the place, and I don't have time to do any of these things. In, in my experience, um, and I'm only going to speak to Pinellas County because that's where I'm sitting at this moment, um, we've got the local ordinance that does apply if you've got five or more employees. The local ordinance does not have the damage remedies in there that the state and federal acts do. So it's really once you get into um, 15 employees, that's where you're getting covered by the Florida Civil Rights Act, as well as um, most of the federal statutes, except for the Age Discrimination Act, which gets 20. Um, keep in mind, too, Florida whistleblower um, is 10 employees. 
And unemployment comp, um, you know, you're going to owe that on, you know, regardless of how many employees you have. So yeah, one, one, one employee is wage an hour, one employee is, is uh, uh, a whistleblower, uh, sorry, is, is, is unemployment. Uh, all of those things apply no matter whether it's just me and, and some other person. Right. But I, I mean, I'm going to chime in here. I think most small employers don't follow a lot of the legal jargon, but they do the main things that we talked about tonight. Right. They hire the right people. They don't hire the wrong people. They terminate the people who aren't going to work out pretty quickly. They're fair to people. And, you know, knock on wood, it's mostly a great experience hiring people and employing people. We have 30 employees. I love them all. It's a great experience. We have 25 years in business, haven't had a significant problem. And not because we followed all these rules, but because we got the right people on board. And if somebody's the wrong person, all the right people come and tell me. I don't even you know they, they, the, the problem is that most of our listeners are like you, Alan, and hopefully myself, in that we're entrepreneurial people. We roll up our sleeves. We work hard. They don't mind working. You're first in the door uh, in the morning. You're last in the door going out at night. You make the coffee. You wash the windows, whatever the scenario is. And you just try to do the right thing. And, and oftentimes, uh, uh, employment law doesn't care whether you do the right things. And, and, and because of that, you get burnt. And, and, and people like Colleen are, are trying to help people like us from getting burnt. And Bob, I'll absolutely agree with you. I, you know, many of the situations that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, the people were trying to be kind to the employer, were trying to do the right thing, and but they just didn't follow, you know, the letter of the law. And now the person's disgruntled and has talked to, you know, one of these you know, advertising lawyers who they know the law and they know what's there, what they can use. And so, you know, it seems sometimes unfair to some of the employers who are really trying to do the right thing by these employees. All right, well, I'm going to have to uh, call time out here. Uh, but I really appreciate everyone who's attended. Very much appreciate Colleen Flynn's excellent preparation. And uh, we're going to have Colleen back for another one of these in a few weeks. Bob Burke, always good to hear from you. Thank uh, you. Excellent thoughts. Everyone who's listening, we appreciate your participation. Uh, we will have copies of this on our website, and we can also uh, forward you a copy of this if you'd like to uh, see it again or, or forward it to anyone who you like. Thanks a lot, and good night. Thank you.